I'm eager to explore together with you in the next 30 minutes. Absolutely. I always say Africa is not just where I work, it's my home. You always want to make it innovative, you want to make it the best, best in class, and you want to make it sustainable for the future. So yeah, I think Africa is the new frontier. Uh, you know, everybody's looking to space. We should look into Africa. What's your superpower? Innovation. That's just been the culture in Africa. Consumer behavior has evolved. What is the common phenomenon for petrol stations in Africa? 40 of our 55 countries in Africa, I've never seen a theater on site. There, there is an example why you should not trust ChatGPT, okay? Welcome to the Roof uh, Podcast. We're still in Cape Town, still in the, this beautiful city. Damn, it's amazing. It's uh, I never been there. It's my first time. Uh, it's really, it's really beautiful. It's fantastic, actually. Cape Town has a unique place in the world. That mountain, the beautiful view of the ocean, the Atlantic, and the Indian Ocean on either side. Absolutely amazing. It's a must-see place in the world. But what makes it even more amazing are great people over here. And one of those great people is today with me. It's uh, Vishnu Govender. It's uh, our our star, star of this local industry. The man with 20 years of experience in automotive and uh, and uh, petroleum retail. Yeah, I've researched something about you, man, mm -hmm. yesterday. Yeah, which is great. <laughs> uh, yes, the, thank you for those kind words. Um, yeah, I've definitely been in the automotive and the retail space. Fairly young and what you would call a greenie in the, in the retail and the oil and gas industry. But I think if I look over the last six years, uh, I've been busy with 3M looking at upstreaming and then downstreaming with Gil Barco. So I think combining uh, a little bit of experience in the retail automotive and retail oil and gas, which uh, makes, I don't know whether it's a... Uh, uh, igniting experience, but definitely a whole new experience for the retail industry. Absolutely. And I guess there are a lot of similarities that we'll talk about uh, during this episode. And obviously, we'll focus a lot uh, about the African market mainly, right? And just, I think there is a lot to learn. It's really a unique place. And uh, uh, while I'm here, I think, you know, f first look, you think it w there's the same rules as you can see in all other places across the globe within our market, within our, within our industry. But then when you get a bit deeper, you think that there's some really unique things about, uh, about this particular market that I'm eager to explore together with you in the next 30 minutes. Absolutely. And you know, I always say Africa, Africa is not just where I work, it's my home. And it's it, you have to be passionate about home. And you know, when you're living, breathing the, the environment you are in, you always want to make it innovative. You want to make it the best, best in class, and you want to make it sustainable for the future. So yeah, I think Africa is the new frontier. Uh, you know, everybody's looking to space. We should look into Africa. Yeah. So let's explore it together. Perfect. All right, now it's the time for 24-7 challenge, uh, classic of, of this podcast, 24 seconds, you need to answer them super quick, super fast, uh, those seven questions, and uh, let's see what's going to happen. Ready? Okay. Bring it on. Ready? Bring it on. Let's go. Manned or unmanned? Unmanned. Cash or cashless? Cashless. What do you like most about petroleum retail? Energy. What do you dislike most about petroleum retail? Lack of energy. What's your superpower? Innovation. Cape Town or Johannesburg? Cape Town. Cricket or rugby? Rugby. Yeah. Man, well done. Oh my goodness, that was so fast. Almost like we scripted that. Anyway, so what was the toughest one? I think manned or unmanned. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, again, I've, I'm thinking about hybrid in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely, I prefer unmanned because I think I like to bring innovation and technology to the forefront of everything. But we have a high unemployment rate in Africa and we need... To, to bring labor and labor skills. That doesn't mean uh, we don't have the opportunity to transition or evolve our labor skills. It's just that we are very slow in doing that. And you've answered energy as the thing that you like most uh, about our industry. Can you unpack that a little bit more? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we're definitely in that energy space. I think uh, we are slow to transition. Uh, 
-hmm. And there's, you know, it just comes at the cost of environmental and climate uh, changes. But definitely, I think uh, I love not just the energy from uh, what in raw, uh, raw materials, mm -hmm. but also the energy of the oil companies. Mm -hmm. uh, they are focused in transition. They are focused in making this world more sustainable and more uh, increasing the longevity of it. And they are thinking about how do we bring that energy from the ground onto the surface and into the lives of simplification of, of people. And for me, that energy transition or evolution through all these three stages is absolutely phenomenal. Really interesting. So that was 24-7 challenge with the Vishnu Govender. Thank you. What's your take on the current level of automation in Africa? We've touched that a little bit in the opening, but can you also provide a bit more details on how do you see the current status of the automation in uh, in this region? Yeah, that's an interesting one. And thank you for that. I think um, when I look at, you know, I've been, I've so vastly traveled through Africa. It's like almost you have a continent within a continent. You know, some have evolved quite, quite seamlessly. Uh, some are really behind that curve in terms of evolution uh, into something on an automation level. And you'll find some that are a little bit in between. Um, I think in most cases, there's a lot of skeptics out there. Uh, you know, do I replace the human element into the automated element? And what does the value and the benefits that it bring with? And most importantly, what is the cost factor? You know, my ROI period. Uh, we, we have to be, we have to touch reality on ground. You know, I've come across uh, organizations that turn over millions of dollars and all they work on is the post-it note. You know, I bring in millions of dollars of goods into the country. Uh, I have a consumer that comes to me. I don't even have a uh, CRM system to work with. I write down his order on a post-it note. He goes to the warehouse, uh, to the cashier, pays, and he moves. And that's just the way the business has been done in, in Africa for a long time. Uh, whether we have a level of improvement in that, absolutely. Whether we can do things much better, absolutely. Uh, can we increase our portfolio into the market? Absolutely. On the sticky note point, I just imagined uh, the cleaning service, uh, you know, cleaning in the office and then, okay, what is that? And throwing it away. And there's like an order for <laughs> a couple of millions. <laughs> exactly. You know, and that's just been the culture in Africa. You know, I, I've done it. My forefathers have done it. I've done it, probably my next generation is going to do it. But how sustainable is this? You know, uh, consumer behavior has evolved. They've changed. Our business environment has changed. And uh, we as organizations or organizations in Africa should be considering that change evolution. And the best way to do that is via automation. There's different mechanisms of automation. If I bring it closer to the oil and gas industry, uh, we normally look at... Uh, um, Corrections in automation addresses few areas. The first and foremost area is theft. You know, Africa is noted for its theft. Uh, you know, every time we as an oil manufacturer creates a, um, a solution, you have an individual that will find the opposite of that. Second is administration. As I mentioned earlier on, skills is not of the highest level. We have some really skilled pools of individuals. Sometimes we don't retain their skins, uh, skills within the country. They are generally gone off continent. But those that do remain uh, requires a lot of administration. And, uh, you know, administration errors can occur from time to time. And then the last one is uh, when we look at um, I might be doing things correctly, administrating correctly, but I might not be communicating that uh, more efficient or, uh, efficiently. And in that case, we see a lot of the gaps between written uh, records versus automated records. And that's where I think automation can play a really key role in the sense that bridging that gap, you know, taking the legacy and perfecting it and putting it into the platform of something sustainable. Yeah, I think there are a lot of challenges in the region, but uh, do you feel like there is uh, some sort of acceleration of those those improvements in the last couple of years? Is it happening? So you you also uh, said something around the um, uh, the support uh, and what what role does the government play in this? Uh, you know, creating new opportunities and developing developing the region. Yeah, I think uh, government is definitely on the forefront in terms of regulation. Uh, I think we are we're very much adoptive in terms of regulation. We haven't really looked at 
what are the challenges within country that we can regulate and, and create some sort of working environment. We tend to take a lot out of Europe, out of the US, and we try to adopt that into country. I think that creates a very slow start, but it is effective in the long term. I do see a transition in government, uh, regulatory from market to market. You know, I cover a wide range, east, west, central and southern. And uh, I do see those government transitional changes. The question comes is in uh, enforcement. How do I take something that's on a formulated theory in parliament and adopt it in everyday living uh, and changes in culture? I think that's the part that requires a lot more time education and you know uh, i always say in in africa the road is slow but we will get there uh, we will definitely be there in the, the next few years uh, as i said some countries might be there much faster their adopt their adoption rate is much quicker but definitely i believe regulatory changes is happening and it's going to become more and more enforceable uh, if I had to just touch in, in South Africa, that is a little bit ahead of the curve of the rest of uh, South Africa, uh, so the rest of Africa, uh, we are in the position that we are thinking about vapor recovery right now. Again, you would think somebody that is so much aligned to European sort of mindset and thinking uh, should have been already at that stage right now. And uh, we are thinking about it at the moment. So... That's one. I think while we might be late, we're definitely considering what is the impact to people as society and the environment, and we're trying to, to stabilize that. Those were, let's say, the gaps or the challenges, but uh, there are also some success stories happening in Africa. For example, mobile banking and mobile payments, right? So the World Economic Forum named Africa as the, as the place, as the most mature, advanced place globally when it comes to to mobile banking and uh, mobile uh, payment so it's it's a phenomenon so can you tell a bit more from your perspective what's on the back of this success story first and foremost i think the the environment has really accelerated mobile payments and what i mean by that is we're in a high risk continent in terms of security and safety and cash creates risk uh, cash on the forecourt cash in your pocket and so forth and i think transformation into digital payments or, or cashless payments has really been uh, accelerated because of that. You know, I tend to be at less risk if I don't have cash and, and acceptance of that. Uh, if we look at who's leading that, I strongly believe East Africa is at the forefront of it. M-Pesa runs that uh, that economic block. Uh, uh, you know, the brainchild behind Kenya, uh, Safaricom, they have really accelerated that. Two thirds of the country's GDP funds run through uh, M-Pesa. Uh, they are almost, I would say, getting to a cashless in, uh, environment. You can basically pay for anything. Uh, it's, it's even transformed itself into financial institution as well, not just from a payment platform. So again, I think they've taken a need in the country. And I think this is what I was alluding to earlier on. When we when you look at localizing, understanding the local environment, you tend to create a new value proposition with the right amount of innovation. And I think when you start to consider those two together, we have great minds in Africa. You know, we are able to develop and innovate uh, anything we would like to. And if we just look at addressing the problems of Africa, we would definitely be able to find the solution. It's, it's like a vein that keeps the blood flowing and uh, expands and growth as the ecosystem, as you said. Yeah, and we, we see a lot of uh, similar things in, in other regions as well. So this is really exciting and something that other regions can definitely learn from, from Africa. Yeah, and you know, it, it, the question is, uh, in some cases we are asking, what's the next? I think it's, it's interesting when, when you have a bit of a um, gap in terms of adopting something, so the beauty of that position is that you can skip a couple of steps that the other regions were going through for years. And you can jump from, let's say, from the past to the future directly, you know, eliminating a couple of steps in between, avoiding unnecessary steps that the other countries had to invest and to go through in the last 10 years. Absolutely. I think uh, we can obviously cherry pick the good elements of, of new innovations. It puts us into that, um, into that space. But I think one thing that is 
required for all these new innovations to work is infrastructure. And that is what lacks quite extensively in Africa. You know, we, we've got great landscapes like this beautiful Cape Town. Uh, we have beautiful sites in, uh, in East Africa and in West Africa. But infrastructure is our Achilles heel at the stage. Uh, I think governments and uh, agencies are looking at how do they, they expedite faster uh, in terms of infrastructure growth and development. But... Uh, we, we, we need that component to, to work efficiently. The second component, the second pillar I would look at is user uh, knowledge. And I think, you know, we, while we are, have close to 1.7 billion people in Africa, we have a large amount of our population that are uneducated, with very limited access to smart technology. Uh, we still utilize a lot of uh, legacy phones and legacy information and hardwares, et cetera. So again, I think skills development or skills transition to, to be utilizing these infrastructures and these platforms will be the breakthrough of bringing in new payment options and new payment methods. Exciting. So the next challenge is to chat GPT or not to chat GPT. So uh, what I've done, I've asked chat GPT three tricky questions about, about your region and about our industry here. And uh, you will need to guess uh, which answers we're giving from ChatGPT and which of those I've created myself last night. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a cr uh, curious one because you know, I'm studying my MBA at the moment and I'm also looking at the dilemma. What do I chat GPT? What don't I chat GPT? What do I utilize out of chat GPT and what do I not? So yeah, fire away. Let's try and understand this. When was the first mobile banking transaction done in Africa? Three options, 2007, 2005, or 2009? 2005. Okay, so you think that the timeline should be a, a bit more early than? Yeah, from a banking transaction. It's in South Africa, right? No, in general. In, in, in general. I think about 2005, um, if I look at the timeline in terms of PCs evolution, you know, technology evolution, when the internet more or less started to become a lot more accessible. I think it was the early 2000s. All right. Unfortunately, it's wrong. It's 2007. Uh, so the first mobile transaction in Africa took place in 2007. It was conducted by Safaricom, a leading mobile network operator in Kenya, through their mobile money service called M-Pesa, M-Pesa, the okay. one you mentioned. The correct, other day. correct. So 2007. Oh, wow. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, yeah, a little bit later. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, just from a mobile transactional, uh, it could be 100% spot on. What is the common phenomenon for petrol stations in Africa? Option number one, filling station bars. Option number two, filling station hotels. Option number three, filling station theaters. Bars. Bars. Yes. Are you often there? Yeah. <laughs> Can I meet you in the bar at the filling station? It's, it's strange to say that because... Uh, a few weeks ago, I was in Madagascar, mm -hmm. and the first site I went to, they had a bar okay. at it. Um, definitely, I see um, the fueling stations in Africa are transforming into an omni-channel sort of uh, structure. I think the traditional service station sort of mindset where I went in the front and I fueled and the back, I did a little bit of a quick service, has evolved or changed. Uh, I think we're definitely in the omni-channel space right now. I think uh, fast forward into the future, I think it might evolve a lot more aggressively into a lifestyle sort of center mm -hmm. where we are starting to see not just um, uh, fueling, not just convenience retailing, uh, not just restauranting, but also lifestyle in terms of gyms, in terms of workout, social meeting. And I think, uh, and that's purely because how do I keep the customer uh, engaged for 45 minutes of charging time, for example, of EV? Um, you know, how do I keep him um, uh, closer to, to my environment? So I definitely see that evolution. So bars is probably going to be right up there to keep them busy. It's incorrect. <laughs> so again, um, it's just chat GPT. It's not me, right? Uh, so the right answer is filling station uh -huh. theaters. And the, the punchline is, in some African countries, particularly in Nigeria, petrol stations have become an expected hubs of entertainment and social activity. Filling station theaters often feature outdoor screens or projectors where customers can enjoy movies, sports events, and music videos. 
while they refuel. <laughs> <laughs> I was really surprised. Have you seen anything like that? Uh, I can tell you in all my, but again, maybe it's something for the future, right? Uh, we just don't know how the world will evolve. But definitely on my vast travels to close to 40 of our 55 countries in Africa, I've never seen a theater on site. So there, there is an example why you should not trust ChatGPT, okay? It's not always right. Third question and the final one. When can South African market expect a burst on demand in electric vehicles? Option number one, three to five years. Option number two, five to eight years. Option number three, eight to 10 years. Uh, this is a tough one. I would, um, first let me give you some context and then I will answer it. You know, uh, my personal opinion, when I first looked at the EV market, I thought 2030 and beyond. Uh, I really thought we were very far from that curve. It's definitely something of the future. You know, I grew up in the era where I watched Back to the Future, where they had electric cars, you know, the night Riders, where they had electric cars, talking cars. And it's just great in the movies. You never could touch it and feel it right now. Uh, fast forward that in the um, uh, 2020s, uh, we're seeing it now in South Africa. Uh, we see a lot more electric vehicles, more visible. We see charging points a lot more visible. Um, we're seeing consumer behavior changing where previously they looked at, you know, the fast and the mechanically sound vehicles. Now they're talking about environmentally conscious vehicles and energy sustainable vehicles. So again, I when I look at those two combinations, uh, I would say anything between the five to seven years, we should be, I think that was an option number two, uh, between five to seven years where we will see, you know, the change of vehicle need much sooner than the 2030s that I initially thought about. So five to eight years, so that's yeah. your answer. Mm -hmm. R wrong again? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's right. Okay. It's right. Finally, you made it. <laughs> Based on current trends and developments, a more specific estimate would be that South Africa can expect a notable burst in demand uh, in electric vehicles within the next five to eight years. So well done. Finally won, won 33%. <laughs> but you know, also we need to put that into context, right? Um, we, we need to understand the challenges of South Africa. I think the entire world knows we are in an energy crisis in South Africa. It's called load shedding. And it has crippled both not just development, but infrastructure investment. Uh, but while government is working around the clock to, to get that resolved, uh, we need to understand what is the impact of EV because in terms of transitioning, uh, you know, it's one thing having an EV great environmentally feasible vehicle on the forecourt being charged, but powered by a gasoline generator at the back end. Yeah, you know, yeah, it yeah. just doesn't serve so its, it's purpose. So it's fake sustainability. Yeah. But on, on, the, on the EV piece, uh, I strongly suggest to all our listeners to listen to the uh, one of the previous podcasts that I've made with uh, Om Shankar. That was exciting introduction to the to the world of uh, e-mobility so mm -hmm. and also you can also check it out and maybe learn something for, for yourself fantastic thank you will do all right so probably a couple of final questions uh, i have for you what can other regions and countries learn from from african context and what can Africa learn from from other regions as well yeah i have that the first word that comes to mind is resilience I think uh, Africa has built up a resilience, you know, we, we, we resilience and we persevere. Uh, we, 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 we tend to, we, if we are struck with something hard and difficult, we suck it up and we move forward. Uh, I think we've built on new platforms, new innovations, new, new infrastructure, the African way. Uh, so I think it's something for us to be proud of. We should be standing on the hilltop and really, really providing it to the rest of the world. I think what we don't do effectively or efficiently is taking that technology to the to the outside world. A really great example is uh, we, we are challenged in Africa with the new vehicles. You know, we don't really manufacture, apart from South Africa, we don't really manufacture at the in the rest of Africa with the little pockets here and there. And Mobius Motors in Kenya that had an opportunity to be innovative. They've taken, uh, they looked at the used car market, roughly about seven to $8,000 to have a vehicle brought in from the East. And then they said to themselves, how about we build one for seven to $8,000 in, in Kenya, 
for uh, instead of a used vehicle. And they've done that successfully. And, I, you know, that tells me we have capability. Uh, we have technology uh, from an investment perspective to bring into, into, into Africa. We need to leverage that to the rest of the world. The second part is... Uh, what can other companies globally look at in terms of in terms of Africa? My famous saying is, Africa is not for sissies. Uh, it's it's a it's a really tough environment. There are elements and pockets of goodness, and. If you want to do things compliantly and ethically, there are organizations that can help facilitate that into Africa. The new frontier and the opportunities are in Africa. Uh, my advice to them is to stay that course. Uh, there is opportunity. Uh, Af Africa has a need for innovation. They have a need for, for changes in lifestyle. And uh, we want to be, to be able to embrace that new technologies and that new companies that are thinking from the outside to come into Africa and to share and to uh, invest and to grow skills because that's the important part. You know, to become sustainable, we have to create skills development on the continent. Uh, far often we see uh, global companies coming into Africa bringing a whole lot of expats coming in, uh, managing all the, the key sustainable sort of decision-making. And before they re we realize, they decide to leave. And that organization's fall flat. And I think it's important to do that skills transfer onto the continent. And if we do that, both the companies will benefit in terms of expansion and market share penetration. We are, as I mentioned earlier on, 1.7 billion people is definitely an opportunity to fight for. Also considering we have a high youth population that are coming out of university, looking for new and innovative jobs, and they will be able to give that creative, cre creative thinking into the organization as well. And to sum that up, I think, uh, Apart from just uh, profitability and uh, revenue and penetration, you also have the ob opportunity to invest socially. And I think that's what companies are all about these days. So as usual, as we conclude, it's all about people in the end of the day, right? Finding 100%. the right people, finding the right partners, bring the best, uh, best in class experiences and processes, uh, twisted uh, towards the local context, find people who share the same uh, ideas and same beliefs locally, and this is the key to success. Absolutely. It comes down to people. I could not think of anything better. Cool. That's a great conclusion of our discussion today. It was such a pleasure having you here. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited, really engaged. That, that was very powerful. I've learned a lot during the, the last 30 minutes. So thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Subscribe, like, and uh, see you in the next episode. Thank you very much. All the best.